wonderful. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, my friends, we're going to live about living in life with no lives at all because we have John Mark Coma on this story box today. Now, for those of you that don't know who he is, John is the founding pastor of Bridgetown Church in Portland, Oregon. Uh, he's a director and teacher of Practicing the Way, and he's the best-selling author of The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry and four other previous books too. He has a new book coming out, which I'm very excited to dive into today with you, John. It's called Live No Lies which I basically said in the very beginning because that's what we're going to be doing today and teaching more about it. It's called Recognize and Resist the Three Enemies that Sabotage Your Peace. John, man, welcome so much to the Storybox podcast today. I'm so happy to be along. I have a deep, deep heart of love for Australia. As a, not that It's easy to love a country. It's hard to love people, <laughs> but it's easy to love a people group. And uh, in fact, we were in Australia right before COVID hit. The wow. month before, and it was just a wonderful trip. And uh, I'm, I don't. Sounds like I won't be able to get back in until about 2025, 2026, or something like that. that way. So <laughs> just have to carry that memory in my heart. <laughs> well, we'll adopt you anyway, man. So you're more than welcome when you do end up getting back over here. Please do let me know, and then we can make something definitely happen uh, over this yes, way. But it. thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Uh, like I mentioned in the intro, I'm very excited to talk about your new book and why it's important, why it's powerful. Before we do all that, before we unbox your story, uh, the very first question that I do have for you is one that I do ask all my guests at the very start, and it is, what does success look like for you? Hmm. Well, you know, at the risk of giving you kind of a spiritual or a Christian answer, you know, um, that is disingenuous to just like my honest humanity. I, I think at, at 30,000 feet, it would be, you know, 30, 40 years from now, I'm a, a, a saint in Christian language, not, not in the Catholic technical sense of saint, you know, sainthood, but becoming a person who is pervaded by love, mm -hmm. which is the, the kind of definition of what it means to be holy that's very christian language in the christian tradition and uh yeah i just would love to become somebody who over many years of life is deeply loving and mm -hmm. joyful and peaceful and wise so i i think in in recent history at least in christian culture we've kind of traded saints for celebrities yeah. but all all of us have this deep desire this kind of latent desire for sainthood in us. And that's what I'm trying to kind of tap into in my own life and in a lot of my work. As you've gone through this journey of life and you've had a lot of different experiences, no doubt, come up, what have you learned that real love actually is? What does it translate into? Well, I mean, the first thing I would say is it's not feeling good, you know, though for sure, like uh, mutual affection and compassion and, you know, it, it, there's a feeling component to it, but love is a verb. It's something that you do. And love as defined by Jesus is to will the good of another ahead of your own, no matter the cost to yourself. Yeah. So I think I write about that in the book. You know, there's a lot of talk about love right now, even in the culture wars, but rarely is love defined. And when people actually, when you press down on, okay, what do you mean there by love? Often what people mean is, sexual desire or affection or compassion for another person or just being nice again not, not bad things but you know love jesus has this famous saying greater love has no one than this that a person lay down their life for their friends mm -hmm. so for jesus the the center point of love is literally giving your life away for the good of another Mm -hmm. So, um, so I want to be nice. I want to be compassionate. I want to have good, warm fuzzies in my heart when I'm around people. Um, but ultimately I want to become a person of, of agape in new Testament language, a person of self-giving sacrificial love. Yeah. I love that, man. And what do you love the most about yourself and your story? Oh, goodness. You know, at my worst, I, which will tell you something about my personality that you just asked, what do I love the most about myself? And I said <laughs> at my worst, you just little, little window into my journey to maturity. 
Um, at my worst, I'm an idealist. Mm. At my best, I'm a spiritual realist. So, you know, um, there are different theories of personality. Uh, one that I use a lot is the Myers-Briggs theory of personality, which is based on Carl Jung and his work. He's the person who developed the, you know, the framework of introvert and extrovert and very well respected. And there's this fun little thing. If you know your Myers-Briggs type where you can, if there's four letters to it. So it's INTJ or ESFP or whatever. You can Google your four letters and like a famous movie. Mm. And when I stopped doing that a long time ago, because in every single one, I am like the evil arch villain. So in Star Wars, I'm not even Darth Vader because he like comes around at the end and he started out. I'm Emperor Palpatine, you know, <laughs> in Harry Potter. I'm he who must not be named like I am the evil genius. If you Google like the famous, you know, my personality type, it's like all the genocidal communist leaders is like Stalin and Lenin responsible for the greatest genocide in human history, a hundred million killed. Like it's, it's these idealists that often wreak havoc, you know what I mean? In some like ideal kind of larger good. Mm -hmm. And, um, but what I love about myself is, uh, I, I, and it's hard for me to even think that way because of my wiring. I, I tend to be hard on myself, um, which is, which I have to go away from that. But mm -hmm. I think that, part, you know, the best thing about you is the worst thing about you. Best part about me is I can envision a better future than a, the present. Mm -hmm. And I can work hard to kind of move myself or people that I serve in that direction. And the, the, the underbelly to that is idealism and I can be too controlling and I can be hard on myself or others. But when I'm at my best, the, the matured and maturing version of me, there's a deep ability to kind of hold uh, the reality of the human condition before my mind and be kind of brutally honest about what is, but yet incredibly hopeful and wise about how to move forward. So I think my brain is kind of wired that way. And at my best, I, I'm like a pastor version of a novelist, you know, just like really learning to pay attention to what is and help people understand their experience of, of life, you know, and you I think do, there was uh, a second question there. I can't remember what it was. Well, you love the most about your story, but I think it kind of, oh yeah, you do a great job at combining the two in teaching others all these aspects of life, which I honestly love. Like for someone as someone like me that oftentimes I love learning and I, I love the way that you teach. It's funny, but it also comes across very simple yet it has so much profound wisdom in it. And I love that style of teaching. And this question kind of I might, it might tie into your book a little bit, but when we're talking about living no lies in our life, why do you think that people struggle with not loving themselves in particular or not loving others more or less? Well, l let me, hmm. I want to respect, you know, the different people listening from different faith or no faith perspectives. Yeah. Um, when in doubt, quote somebody smarter than you. There's a, <laughs> there's a psychologist from Yale named Lori Santos. She's not a Christian, but I've, I appreciate her work. And I was listening to a podcast with her, actually, because the podcast is a good time. Mm. And she had some great insight about how um, I don't, was this a thing on Australia? I kind of came of age and in the nineties, there was this massive push toward like self-esteem. Was that a thing at all in Australia where part of the educational system and part of the wider kind of pop culture, there was this massive push toward the self-esteem movement. Was that a thing in Australia or no? Was it the me too movement? No, not me too. Uh, self-esteem. Like this was much, okay. much longer ago, the nineties kind of 90s, 2000s, kind of helping children feel good about themselves and you're good and there's nothing wrong with you and just the way you are. Was that a thing at all or, or no? Did that, did that escape the cultural trends of Australia? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest. I don't know, but I can only imagine that it would have been a thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> with, with the way well, culture's headed. <laughs> it, in America, it was very much a part of the culture. So I'm a part of this generation that kind of grew up hearing, you know, feel good about yourself, you know, person positivity, like you're great just the way you are. Don't let anybody look down on you. You're beautiful. And, you know, a lot of the research now has come in because it's been 20 years or whatever of that cultural messaging. And basically the, the data is really bad. 
it actually has not made people feel better about themselves because the problem is we actually know that there's all sorts of aspects of us that are bent out of shape and that are broke and that are hurt and that are narcissistic and that are unloving and that are neurotic and anxious and grasping for control. And we dominate and manipulate other people. We're, we're all, you can't be smarter than your brain. So, you know, you can attempt to delude yourself, but we all know there's this broken part of us. And when you create a pride position, you create a shame position Meaning the moment that you, you know, attempt to live into a message of I'm great just the way I am, you immediately then feel not freedom, but you feel shame because yeah. you know that there's aspects of you that actually aren't great. Yeah. And so what Lori, who is a secular psychologist, was advocating for was she said better than self-esteem, we should encourage people towards self-compassion. Yeah. So when you have that moment of you screw up, you do something, you know, unkind or unloving or unwise, rather than delude yourself with some narrative that says, no, I'm great just the way I am, which is not true. Mm -hmm. uh, rather just say, I'm human. I, I screwed up. I, I made a mistake. I need to have compassion on myself. Mm -hmm. I think that's great advice. I think even better advice is not self-compassion, but is the compassion of the father and the son and the Holy spirit. Yeah. Um, God and the Christian tradition. And that's why I'm a Christian. It's why I find Jesus more compelling than any other thinker, teacher, luminary in human history. His vision of God as a community of love, call it the Trinity, call it the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, this community of self-giving, interpersonal delight and agape and joy and mutual affection and surrender and this, this, this God, this creator being at the center of all reality, whose overwhelming emotional disposition toward you and toward me, toward all is one of compassion mm. for our humanity, for all the mistakes we have made, make as we speak and will make in the future. That to me is, I, I just don't know of a more beautiful worldview to live out of. Yeah. You explained it perfectly, man. And I love how you brought in Laurie Santos there. Cause I do listen to a lot of her work and it is oh, great. great. I love, I love yes. the, the intersection between the secular and the spiritual and, and trying to see how the world looks at things, but also how God looks at things. And you can take, you can take away things from both. Honestly, that's the way I've experienced it. I've had people that aren't Christians help me in my life and I've had Christians help me too. So it's, and me being a person of faith as well, I yes. already, I already know what is true from the word of God and all that yes. sort of stuff, but it doesn't mean that you can't not be helped. So yes, that's the way hundred percent. I mean, wisdom is wisdom is wisdom. You yeah. know, uh, you know, in the old Testament, there's this whole genre of literature that scholars call the wisdom literature. The most famous book would be Proverbs. Yeah. And if you study Proverbs, half of the sayings aren't Hebrew. They're not Jewish. They're, you know what I mean? They're from like ancient Mesopotamia or Babylon or these quote pagan kind of cultures. They don't reference even uh, Old Testament theology or the story of Israel or the Exodus or the one true God. They're just these wisdom principles. And so, you know, Christians and before them, Hebrews and followers of God have long kind of said, hey, truth is truth is truth. You know, there's a famous kind of maxim, all truth is God's truth. Yeah. Um, meaning, you know, breakfast is a great idea, whether it comes from a Christian or a Hindu or a Buddhist or an atheist, it doesn't make it, it doesn't make the idea good or bad. It's just, it's a good idea, you yeah. know? And, uh, and there are many other things such as that. hundred percent, man. And does all this, like we're talking about love and, and wisdom and all that, does all that, play a part in us achieving real peace at all? Yeah. I mean, again, I'm like you, I am thoroughly Christian to the core. <laughs> and so from my perspective, not at all in an us versus them framing, but from my perspective, you know, whether you are a secular person or a Christian or something else, any attempt to achieve peace based on your external circumstances is doomed to failure. Yeah. You know, as a mentor of mine said to me recently after his life, it, it was literally like a Greek tragedy. This horrific uh, thing happened to him that I won't, I won't share horrific. I mean, like almost worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. And he was talking to me about what he'd been learning. He's very strong Christian. 
And he had this great line. He said, good circumstances are not an adequate foundation upon which to build your life. And so as long as your attempt to achieve, to achieve inner peace is to achieve outer peace, life will feel like a giant game of whack-a-mole. You know what I mean? It's like, fix one problem, another one. Fix that problem, another one. Fix that problem, three more spring up, you know? And it's just, you do that long enough that, you know, that's why by most people, by the middle of their life, by mid-age, they're either really wise or they're starting to get really cynical because that game of whack-a-mole, I either either you realize you can't beat it and you get mad or angry or cynical about it, or you live in delusion and you keep trying to hack the system or you accept this is what is that there's a place for solving problems, but at some point, and we realize this as we age, the deepest problems of our life can't be solved. They can only be forgiven. And um, so I, I think that's where the Christian tradition has a wealth of wisdom and a body of truth and practices that are so ancient and beautiful for us to live in peace now, no matter what our external circumstances are w without being, you know, uh, attempting to like transcend our humanity or the circumstances. We have a bad day. You get sad. You have a bad year. You get sad, but uh, enabling to still, th there is a way to hold bad circumstances from a deep place of peace in God. Yeah. You were talking in your book as well, like in, in revolving around the things that kind of go in life that do sabotage your peace. And there's three areas that you do touch on. You break it down. You say you got the devil, you got the flesh, and you got the world. I kind of want to touch on, if I if we can, a little bit of all three. Um, and the first one that I want to sort of dive into is the devil. So yeah. Just right into the deep end there. Right into the deep end. <laughs> Wim Hof podcast interview. Let's do it. <laughs> so how, how does the devil, and for those people that don't even believe in the devil, for, for starters, how does the devil come about and try and sabotage your peace in God? Yeah. Well, okay. There are days, if not weeks of conversation here. <laughs> I have to say it in two minutes. Um, you know, most modern Western people scoff at the idea of a devil. I mean, it's, we think of it, at least if we're honest, and even a lot of Christians are here still mm -hmm. as, you know, this pre-modern myth, you know, right up there with, you know, Thor's hammer and Santa Claus. Yeah. And now that we have science, now we know there's not, you know, a demon behind, you know, world events or whatever, but it's impossible to follow Jesus and not take the idea of a devil seriously because mm -hmm. it was a major theme in Jesus' life, in his work, and in his teachings. And Jesus is incredibly intelligent. And again, I posit that he's the most intelligent teacher to ever live ahead of a Laurie Santos, as brilliant as she is, or Stephen Hawking, or mm -hmm. Yuval Harari, name your brilliant atheist of choice or materialist of choice. And, uh, Jesus, a central theme in his teachings, a central theme in his teachings is this creature called the devil, this immaterial but real intelligence that is evil to the core and at work to drive the human soul and society itself into anarchy, chaos, ruin, and death. Mm -hmm. And he's anti-God and God is love, which means he's anti-love. So anywhere there is love, his attempt is to ruin it, fragment it, corrupt it, pervert it, end it, stamp it out. But what's fascinating, and this is the summary, is in Jesus' most in-depth teaching on the devil in the Gospel of John, he doesn't talk about what I would expect him to talk about, the stuff out of the Hollywood movie or even a lot of Christian culture, um, which doesn't mean that stuff isn't true, a, a poltergeist or a horror story or a ghost or a nightmare or a tsunami or a disease or a demonization or an exorcism. What does Jesus talk about? John chapter 8, he calls the devil the father of lies says when he lies, he speaks his native language and he has great things to say about lies and the role of deception in our life. So a lot of my book, hence the title, Live No Lies, is a kind of deep dive into the role of truth and lies, not just in our mind, our imagination, but in our formation into people of love or in or a deformation into people of something else. You know, in, in the context of the devil teaching, Jesus has that famous line, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. One of the most famous teachings in Western history, or, or I'm sorry, global history. 
And, you know, if you reverse engineer that saying, Jesus was simultaneously saying, you're in bondage to lies. You are in bondage to deceptive ideas, to false narratives about the good and the beautiful and the true and what will actually make you happy and lead you to the life you want. Mm -hmm. And so at the root of the, the greatest problems in the human condition and in, and in our culture overall are these lies, these deceptive ideas, these false, untrue narratives about what will lead to goodness. Mm. I'm curious, what lie has the devil kind of tried to make you believe over your life? Oh, there's not, there's not one. There's a whole <laughs> lot, you know? And again, um, uh, often if, if you take Jesus seriously, we all have these thoughts that are more than just thoughts. It's like these thoughts are animated by a dark spiritual energy. And we all know what it's like to have a thought that we don't want, that we don't know where it comes from per se, or it comes from somewhere bad, but it's like the thought has a will. It's like it has the, and it's like a malignant will, like it's after us. Like it, it wants to make us stressed or anxious or insecure or angry or bitter or to cut off a relationship. It's like it wants to wreak havoc in our soul and in our life. Now, you could attempt to explain that through neurobiology and evolutionary biology, and it's our great ancestors on the plains of Africa scanning the horizon for threat, and so our amygdalas heighten anytime we see a threat you can tribal we have to you know fight against other tribes you could attempt to give it an evolutionary explanation which by the way is a theory that that's how the brain is wired that way mm -hmm. it's a hypothesis um, which is based on some science could be very well true or you could explain it through a more spiritual lens like hey what if some of these thoughts that enter our mind are actually animated by some kind of spiritual dark energy, call that a demon and call that what, whatever language your, your comfort level is with, mm -hmm. um, in Jesus teaching and in the Christian tradition, there very much is a, a, a place that would say some thoughts are just thoughts, but some thoughts actually have a external spiritual source and energy behind them. And they want to ruin you. So in my mind, and through my life, there has been not one, but all sorts, you know? So I'm currently in a, a massive um, career kind of switch from I just finished a few days ago, uh, past serving as the kind of pastor for teaching and vision at a church we planted 18 years ago. And I'm about to uh, take a break and then launch a new nonprofit. And so, you know, there are thoughts in my mind of, it's all going to be a disaster. Uh, I, I will lose my ministry. I will lose, you know, the ability to preach. I will, nobody will care what I have to say anymore. I'm, I'm setting my family up for financial disaster. I'm going to ruin our, I mean, I've given up this incredible, you know, opportunity we've had to serve our church. There are all these thoughts and I'm sure some of those are just normal human thoughts, yeah. but there are some that literally I will sometimes wake up in the middle of the night, my mind instantly racing, imagining myself like in bankruptcy court and my children hate me. And it, you know, God's abandoned me that like, where does that come from in the middle, literally wake me up in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. So I think often these are the enemy attempting to sabotage my peace and sabotage the narratives that I live in because the story that you live in is the story you live out. The thoughts that you let play in your mind will shape the person that you become. What you give your mind and your imagination and your attention to will shape the trajectory and the destiny of your soul. So what questions should we ask ourselves on the regular basis to determine whether or not it is the devil actually getting into our psyche or if it's actually the flesh, the sinful nature of us, our own desires, our own mind just going into those dark places and asking those, those negative thoughts, if, if I can use that word, how, how, what questions should we be asking ourselves? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, first off, those two things, the, the devil and the flesh go so well together. And, and the flesh is New Testament language for those of you that are new to the Bible for the kind of primal animalistic appetite, the survival instinct in you that's bent toward greed and lust and objectification and domination and grasping for control and fear. This kind of animal brain is what a scientist would call it. That's inside all of us. 
So in the book, I have this paradigm of, you know, the devil, the flesh and the world. And, and I reframe it through this little thesis statement of that the devil's primary stratagem or evil's primary stratagem is deceptive ideas or lies that play to disordered desires or our flesh that are normalized in a, in a sinful society. So the, the enemy's lies um, are not random. They play to some deep bent desire in our heart. So it's not like, hey, Elvis is alive and hiding in Mexico. Believe it. You know, it's not, it's not that. That has no bearing on my life. That, that's no emotion. I have no emotional attachment to that. It's, you know, hey, you would be way happier married to a different person. You should divorce your wife. You need to be true to yourself. You need to be honest. You need what it's these lies that play to this deep kind of broken fissure in my heart. And so that's where, as narratives come to the surface of our mind, we don't always know, is this from the devil? Is this from me? Is this from a sitcom I was watching last week? One of the helpful ways to discern, you can ask, where does this lie come from? And then you can ask where it's going. Where does it come from? Meaning, what is this? Um, what's, the, what's, the, what's the narrative? What's the emotion or the feeling underneath the narrative? Fear, anxiety, gratitude, contentment. Uh, anger, bitterness, and then what's the attachment, to use the language of psychology, underneath that emotion? So it could be, you know, the narrative could come, my career is over. It's all going to be downhill from here. Okay. What's the emotion connected to that? Uh, mostly anxiety with some insecurity and some grief. Okay. What's the attachment under that? Ooh, well, maybe that my life has to, my career has to keep going up and to the right for me to feel happy. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not quote more successful five years from now than I am now, if I don't feel like, oh man, more people are reading my books and listening to my stuff and, and blah, 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 then, oh, oh, then I'm not happy. And if it were to go down, God forbid that life doesn't trend up and to the right. Um, then I, how could I be a happy, content, grateful, peaceful person? Oh, so, so maybe there's an attachment or some Christians would call it an idol. Maybe actually what I'm worshiping is not Jesus and the father and the spirit. Maybe it's actually up into the right career mobility and more money and more book readers and more whatever, you know, mm -hmm. oh, that's my flesh. That's a, a bent part of my heart that is needing something other than life with God to be happy and at peace. And so whether that lie comes from the enemy or not, it's, it's coming to or from at some level, our flesh, this deep kind of bent part of attachment. And then you can kind of ask, where does this lie go? Like if I were to live into this narrative as if it's true, um, that my, the, my, the best days of my career might be behind me. Where does that go? Well, probably to overwork, probably to lack of boundaries, probably to enmeshment in my identity and my job, probably to sacrificing my family for my job, probably to traveling too much, doing too many podcast interviews, too many things to, you know, uh, this hurry to fear, to anger, to competition with other people. Yeah. I, I don't, I do not want to live into that narrative. No, me and, and so is there a better narrative? Is there a true narrative something like man god so graciously used me for the last 18 years what a gift and mm -hmm. i feel this is what he's put on my heart and i don't have an audible voice of god but i think that i'm following god's leading and my job is just to make my contribution and to be the best version of myself through following jesus and we'll see what god does with it but i'm just a servant and i just want to serve well over the long term that that's a different narrative that I think would be a much better narrative to live into. Yeah. Beautifully said, man. Thank you for sharing that. That made yeah, a lot of sense, a lot of sense to me. Um, I've got a couple more questions for you because I do need to be respectful of your time. I'm really, really enjoying this. Um, you do mention the world and I grew up in a Christian environment and they did talk about, you know, we live in the world, but being not of the world. And in a Christian sense, what does it actually mean by the world sense and how does that revolve around the lies that the world brings in into our lives? Yeah. Well, first what the world is, then what the world does, what the world is, 
It, this is G, language used by Jesus and the New Testament writers for this kind of system out there of um, ideas and beliefs and practices and social norms and and expectations that are not under the rule of God, but actually anti the rule of God are built around kind of rebellion against God and the redefinition of good and evil, not based on the love and wisdom of God in scripture, but based on the flesh, on human desire, what we want and our own desires for survival, domination, greed, control, so on and so forth. And if the world is a concept that's all over scripture, all over the church tradition and has been lost for a lot of, you know, younger Western Christians, we just call it the arts and entertainment or mm -hmm. politics or economics or systemic racism. But these are these are all a part of this larger system of anti-God. It's like the anti-kingdom of God called the world that is formative. We all, we become like our environment. Like you become like Sydney. I become like Portland. We're formed for better or for worse against our will or with our will to become like our environment. And the world is this environment that we're all born into. What it does is it normalizes sin and it numbs uh, what the, our conscience and our ability to discern good from evil. So I use this kind of very simple analogy in the book. That's a funny one that any married couple will laugh at. Of uh, you know, sometimes on a on a Tuesday night, midweek, I'll I'll. And so the backstory here is I'm 41. I don't have a great metabolism. You know, I, I it's I'm, I can't have dessert. I try to have dessert once a week, just on our Sabbath <laughs> night, and I, most of the time I try unsuccessfully. <laughs> uh, I'm just hearing Yoda right now, you know, do or do not, there is no try. And uh, so sometimes on a Tuesday night, I'll, I'll ask my lovely wife of 20 years, you know, hey, honey, do you do you want some ice cream? And I'm not actually, or can I get you some ice cream? I'm not actually asking if she wants ice cream. I don't care if she wants ice cream. I want ice cream. <laughs> and I want a find, to find a, a, a way to justify my guilt and excuse my guilt and justify eating ice cream on a Tuesday night. <laughs> and so if I, can, if I can trick my brain, if I can delude myself into thinking that actually I'm eating this ice cream to be a loving husband for my wife, just to be there. She had a rough day, you know, and she had a hard conversation and didn't go great with the kids. And, and so I, she, she needs some ice cream. And of course, you know, she has a vested interest in saying yes too, because it's it's a mutually it's a beneficial lie. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and often it's like when we want to do something we know we shouldn't do, we'll ask the very people that want to do the same thing. So maybe you want to buy a new car and you don't actually have the money. You don't need a new car, and it's a bad financial decision. So what do you do? You ask your friend who just bought a new car and shouldn't have. Hey, do you think it'd be cool? Do you think it'd be all right? They're like, yeah, go for it. So they justify their guilt, and so do you, and you both make a bad decision together. So the world is, this is just a human dynamic. I'm not saying this to shame anybody. I do this. I'm guessing that even you, Jay, do this once in a while with friends or interpersonal relationships. The world is this kind of dynamic in mass where we're all kind of telling each other what our flesh wants to hear in order to, in, in a, in a unhealthy attempt to alleviate guilt and shame. Mm -hmm. And there, we all, we all live with guilt and shame and there are unhealthy toxic ways of dealing with that. And there are beautiful ways of attending to our guilt and our shame, mm -hmm. but uh, an unhealthy and a toxic way is just to attempt to delude ourselves into thinking that our sin is not actually sin. Yeah. We try and justify it. <laughs> so this 100%. is true. And it's, yeah, it's kind of like this vicious cycle that I sometimes get myself in and I'm going to break. <laughs> it's no easy thing to do, but um, you, you have this new book coming out, Live No Lies, uh, which comes out in a, just a few days, actually, from the day we are recording this. Congratulations. Oh, great. Thank on you. writing this book. Uh, where can people get it, uh, learn more about you, man, and connect with you before I ask the final couple of questions? Well, it should be, uh, my website is johnmarkcomer.com. It should be available uh, anywhere books are sold. In fact, and this is embarrassing. Uh, this is my first interview I've done from Australia. And I actually have a couple of different, I have an American publisher, I have a UK publisher. I'm not sure which one has uh, distribution rights to Australia. So uh, one yeah. of them, probably my UK, the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth still a thing, right? Yeah. I don't know. It should being. be available on, <laughs> on whatever Amazon is in Australia. You should be able to get it. Uh, well, I'll, I'll make sure online. 
I'll make sure that people know where to get it, even if they are in Australia, America, you name it. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, John, when was the the most vulnerable moment for you writing this book? Was there one? Yeah, well, you know, you you write a book um, that is a very long process yeah. from kind of conception to publication. And so I'd already written the rough draft before COVID hit and all of the massive cultural upheaval. And so I was editing this book through the summer of 2020 when my city was on fire with 100 days straight of violence between police and protesters. And it was, and the book is the first thing I've ever written that does get into some of the culture war stuff. Not like in an angry, let me take a side, but there's some controversial stuff in the book. Not not angry, controversial, and it's all very Christian orthodoxy, but Christian orthodoxy is becoming increasingly radical. Yeah. And um, so I'm, I'm doing all of these edits and attempting to nuance and make it better in the middle of just cultural chaos. And there was a lot of vulnerabilities, like, oh, a lot of second thoughts, like, should I even release this book? We came really close to literally just putting it on the shelf, not, not, not literally because it never would have been published and just getting rid of it and not publishing it. Um, and I, my great fear was, well, I don't want to just pour more gas on the fire of the culture wars and the anger and the fear and the outrage online. But at the same time, th there's a lot of Christians trying to find their way through the idea landscape of the world right now. And I, I really want to help them. I want to help give some mental maps from the teachings of Jesus. So decided to, to stick with it and release it. Um, and, and just doing my very best to release it in a firm, but gentle and humble way. Mm. And I'm so glad that you didn't keep it on the shelf because <laughs> I know it is going to help many, many people. John, my final question for you, this is my all time favorite question. I ask everyone at the end, it's a hypothetical one, but I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. All your friends and your family have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll just call it magic for sake of argument. I know, stay with me. But being able to get it all and show it to you on your 100th birthday, what do you want that film to say and to show about your life? I would love, like all good stories, for it to show a massive change of character over a long period of time. I would love it to show some of my worst moments in my 20s and 30s, yelling at my kids, making unkind comments to my wife, being in a hurry everywhere, being unwell, stressed out, depressed, anxious. And then I would love that to be juxtaposed against who I would become at 100 someone calm and joyful and relaxed and wise and kind. And rather than showing a perfect story, I would rather have it show a dramatic transformation, you know? And I would love my kids to tell my grandkids who, and, and the great grandkids at that point at hundred, if I'm doing the math right, that, yeah, you experience him as, you know, this, that, and the other, but actually he, he was a deeply angry or anxious and unkind young man with full of zeal and ignorance and self-righteous energy, but he was transformed through following Jesus. So yeah, I, I would love something like that. And I would love even the season I'm in right now of kind of transition from the first half to second half of life and giving up one job I've had for almost two decades. I would love to that be like kind of a defining moment, like from here on, like, um, some, some really beautiful things started to happen in his life. Um, not that they haven't, but that's a great question. Mm. I'll have to think about that. One of my mentors said to me recently, uh, when I was trying to make this decision about the church, he had the best thought experiment, very similar. He said, if, if your life was a movie and you were watching it, what would you, the protagonist, the lead character, what would you have to do in this decision you're facing for you, the movie watcher, to respect and admire you. Yeah. I thought, oh, that, that's a great guiding question. Yeah. It is. Wow. I'm just, I'm just picturing all that. This is going to give me a moment to process it. <laughs> but I feel like that is a, a great send-off message for everyone that has been listening today and, and watching even. John Mark Comer. 
Thank you so much for your time today, man, for your story, your wisdom, your advice. Live no lies, everybody. Go and get a copy. It's available everywhere books are sold by the time that this episode does come out. But thank you so much for joining me today on the Storybox podcast. Thanks for having me on.